Shalom Aleichem and welcome back, Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Bruck. Part 2 of the introduction to the Sefer Derech Hamuna. Introduction, yes, just the introduction. The Sefer itself we're going to get to, that could be endless. Mitzvah Hashem, we'll get it done. The Ezra Hashem, so thank you very much for joining us again. Last episode, we made it all the way until the 1840s, discussing the history of the learning of Mesech Lezroyim, the Rishonim, the Achreinim. We just finished discussing the Pa'as HaShulchan. Before we go on, is there anything else you want to add to what you talked about in the last episode? Yeah, just uh, two short points. Is that there were people, Yechidim, that did learn Zram. Just to mention just some of them. is One was the great Rabbi Zulcharif, the great Litvish Gadol, who wrote a lot on Yerushalmi. So he has a nice amount on Yerushalmi Zram, a whole volume. It's first printed in the 1860s. And one other great literature Shigadol is that there is his father, but a whole Hebrew to be Miyashiv, the Rebbe Kideger, also a Gadol from who dies in the 1830s, wrote famous Gilyainis on, on Ganshish on Mishnayis. So um, that there is his father, this Rabbi Yaman, a great guy. In, um, if one wants to read about him, it's good to read in the unbelievable autobiography of that Deris or in the introduction to the Hebrew called Mishnas Rabbi Yaman. And basically, this Rabbi Yaman wrote a chibur, on, which was published on Zram and Mayid, being Miyashiv, Mishnayis, all the various Rabbi Kivagers, the Yunin. Um, so we, so the, uh, my claim, the, the point I'm trying to bring out is, yes, people were learning Zram, but it wasn't the same as Nashim Azik, in which there's endless amount of chibur, and Mayid is much more, and the frat one once you get to Allah. That is one point I just wanted to clarify on the previous um, discussion. Okay, so before we proceed, I just want to mention that, again, if anybody wants to sponsor, Baruch Hashem, these are very popular. Many, many people have been listening to these episodes, and again, we'll be getting great feedback. We just got two emails from people who have listened to episodes from the one you did on Yavamis was already a good few months back. I actually listened to it again. If you're learning Yavamis now, it might be good to listen to it again now that you're deep into Yavamis. Someone just sent us an email asking for some of the PDF files that you offered um, during that episode on the Rinas Aaron, which lists some of the Rishayim, they even asked for Davi Safir's article on Rabbi Chana. Two people asked for that, so thank you for bringing that up to everybody. And if you haven't listened to all the episodes, they're all available on all that thing. Again, you could email myself shwedm at ou.org with any questions, comments, suggestions, criticisms. We take it all. Fine. So we're in the 1840s, and we still haven't identified any real svarim, when I say real, svarim that are put out for the regular person to learn and get ideas on Chumas and Maestras. So tell us where we go from here. So if we can't go further on in the century, it's interesting is that in, let's say, 1880, suddenly... More you didn't start going to Eretz Yisrael. The movement um, becomes somewhat more popular. A lot of this is documented in various different works out there. But in the 1880s is when the Pulmus and the various massive controversies about Shemitah erupt. So this, there's an explosion of literature, chuvis from Achreinim. If there's a Heter Mechira, if one could not have a Heter Mechira, if it's necessary, not necessarily all over, everyone's getting involved with this. Um... But there's still yet no chibur of the rest of the mitzvah stories. Parts. Now, Shemitah, um, uh, it's, a fa- it's fascinating, the unbelievable amount of literature about it, in, on the history and the halachic aspects, the sugyas. Um, Mishnayis, well, Mishnayis is learning shviyas, coming to the cl- conclusion soon. And I just, uh, there's a, I want to have some, there's a, today, there's a big minig to plug oneself so I was involved, I had the schuss to be involved putting out a work, now it's available in English, called Studies in Halacha and Rabbinic History, from Rabbi Eitam Henkin, Hashem Yitam Damai, was killed a few years ago, tragically, with his wife, by Arabs. He was an unbelievable writer, a Talmud Chacham, unbelievably talented person, and he wrote numerous svarim and books. One of the things that he was an expert in, amongst many others, was the topic of the Shemitah controversy in all aspects, the historical aspects, 
halachic aspects, and he wrote a lot about it, and sadly he was going to write more, but we lost that. So some of these articles were translated now for the English ilum, um, in a book, it has many other essays, all translated in English, called Studies in Halacha and Rabbinic History. Um, I highly recommend it. Of course, I am saying that I do have a bias because I'm involved with the publication, the preparation of printing this book, but I think it's worth it. Anyway, so this is about um, Shemitah. You mentioned that book. Didn't Nachi Weinstein on his Farm Chatter podcast just have a conversation with his mother? Was it about that book? Yes, 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 he did. He had a very interesting conversation. It's worth listening to also to hear uh, the, mo- the mother, the Rabbi, Rabbi Nid Henkin, talk about her son and about the project in general and other stuff. It's also very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, so, we na- so we're already in the 1880s. It goes, and th- these controversies keep on going. They're still actually going on every year. There's books written on the various poems, but we're looking for all Mitzvah Tlois Barats. So I would like to point to as follows. In early, I, I'm going to show a few briefly some things of other people learning Zeram aspects, and then we're going to try to get closer to us of learning Mitzvah Sotlis Barats and Eretz Yisrael. Number one is that we find, let's say, in uh, nineteen in the nineteen hundred in nineteen hundred, a work comes out called Hilchos Eretz Yisrael. Miyuchis to who the tour. It's printed. Um, it was found by manuscript by uh, by a Ramnasha Grossberg, who was famous for putting out many other works, and um, had Ha'aros from uh, Rebbe Eliezer Simcha, a very chashav, prominent Litvish Gadol at the time, and it's printed in 1900 with Ha'aros. Shortly afterwards, another edition comes out, the same Chibor with Ha'aros from Mayor Don Pletsky and Rav Yoskowitz. Now, this is a, what's significant is this is a Chibor about Hilchas Eretz Yisrael, supposedly Milchas to the tour. It turns out it might not be the tour, but at least it's a Rishon, and it's again a Hilchas Eretz Yisrael. So the people trying to, you know, look for Chiburim, and it's it's already more relevant already because there's much more Yidden out there in Eretz Yisrael. Interestingly enough, as a side point, Ramart Chagifter, um, the great Rosh Hashiva of Tells, eventually puts out an edition of this in, in one of the journals at the time, the, much later on than the 19, 1900. With unbelievable ha'aris, and later on, an edition comes out based on more manuscripts from Ephraim Kufer, who we have spoken about in a previous podcast. Anyway, this is just one work where we have a discovery of a, of a rishon. It's for sure a rishon, and it comes to um, it comes out in early 1900s and um, and onwards. Okay. Now we're moving forward. Is 1914 a work begins to come out from in Varsh, I believe it was printed called Amunaz Ram, which is basically um, someone has malakate all the various chazals, midrashim, everything, all the material that there is on Zram. Let's say Yerushalmi's Mishnayis, the and and all the different purushim on a plain and simple alikut. Um, so it seems there was, a, and it has Chashav Askamas from many different Gedolim at the time. He, he, I think he finishes all of his run. This is in 1914. So you see that in Chutzlar, there was an attempt at least somewhat uh, to make available in order to learn Zram, one has to have the Kalim. So someone else, he was also trying to do such a thing. Just to fast forward a drop before we go backwards, in Chutzlar, it's right before the war, the great Rosh Hashiva Gain Reb David Rappaport, the author of the Migdash David, also writes a Chibor, that has mater- lots of material, lumdish material, and Zrom. But, okay, now, but let's go back to Eretz Yisrael. We're getting to the 1900s. Forget about Shemitah. Shemitah, we said there is materials, but what about everything else? So we must mention, briefly, uh, the great Rabbi Avram Lunds. Rabbi Avram Lunds was an was a, was a unbelievable figure who tragically, he's born in, the, I think, the 1850s, late 1850s or something. Anyway, he's a prolific writer, but he becomes blind before he's even the age of 20. So you think his life is over. I don't know how, but he basically continues being beyond prolific, putting out multiple works. Farum runs a journal, successful, um, called Yerushalayim, and prints all different materials related to Eretz Yisrael. He, he, um, incredible. His, his daughter wrote a very interesting, um, uh, nice long article about him, but he's blind, and somehow he does this, which which shows when there's a will, there's a way. Okay. Anyway, he puts out, significant for us, two chiburim. One is... In 1908, he puts out a Yerushalmi because he held with and he, and he worked very hard for Yerushalmi Zram specifically, trying to track down whatever the best Nuschais at the time, because um, he understood that in order to 
to be able to learn Hilchas Eretz Yisrael and everything, one has to have the the proper kalim. So you have to have the best Vishnu Yishalmi. Okay, it's its own story how it was received. And, and um, for example, um, there's an article from Malachi about this and others. But another safe that he put out was the Kafdar of Ferech that we spoke about in last episode. He also went made it his business. He put it out. It was, I think, a small format. It looks like this in a reprint. Um, not a nice, fat edition. But because he held um, these Chiburim help um, for Eretz Yisrael get in order to learn about Eretz Yisrael, you need to have the Chibur. Okay, fine. So this is 1908, um, to Yishalmi, 1897 was early as the Kafir and he put out other stuff, but uh, we're, we're cutting it short. Okay, now we fast forward to 1913. 1913, something that when I ever, I when I first heard about it, um, I was also, I didn't believe it, and any time I mention it to people, they also don't believe it. Basically is, that um, the various Gedalim at the time, living in Eretz Yisrael, decided to take a trip to travel all over all the different settlements that were going on to see what's going on with the, the different things. The, the, and one of the focuses that in this trip was to see the Shmir HaMitzvahs. Not everyone was from or even remotely from. And just to see the mats of what's going on out there all, in all the many different small little settlements that existed all over the country in Eretz Yisrael. Now, Okay, very sounds very interesting. But the key thing is, it's taking place in 1913. Who were the cast of characters, as they say for fancy term? Who were the people that went on this trip? So um, that is, that, that's what makes it interesting. So um, number one, Rabbi Avram Yitzhak HaKoyin Kuk. Number two, Rabbi Yisuf Chaim Zanunfeld. Number three, Rabbi Yonisim Binyamin Horowitz. Number four, Rabbi Yakim Moshe Harlak. Another great gadol that went on this trip was Rabbi Moshe Kliers. Another was Rabbi Benzian Yadler, and and a few other people. And they traveled, and it was a nice trip. They went to many places, and they not only did they go on a trip and they saw all different things, what's going on. They recorded everything about this trip, and it was even published right away then. And then over the years, uh, um, in the early two thousands, a beautiful edition came out of it. But then even more recently, a much much more expanded edition came out approximately 10 years ago. This is how it looks. And obviously, people are find it shocking that Rubis, Chaim Zanfeld, and Reb Cook were in the same wagon going, touring the country. Now, one of the points was to see the massive of with what needs to be corrected for the mitzvahs of Kalei's Bar. So, okay. Anyway, a lot of interesting things come out from this conversation, um, from this trip, from this tour. Um, okay. Now, which this brings us now to Ramesha Clears, one of the people that went on the trip. So he was a, a, a Slanim Chassid, dies in 1934. He was the Rav Harashi of Tveria, which was a more Hasidish place. Um, and Lamaisa, one of the things he writes is about a book about the history of Tveria, but more significantly for us is he writes one, probably one of the first Halacha de Kasvarim in the 1900s on Zram. It's called Taira Sa'aretz. Few volumes come out in his lifetime. Um, afterwards, more material has come out in recent years. I, I think even very recently, a new edition came out. But anyway, this is the I would say in the nineteen in nineteen twenty five is one of the first halachic works written by one of the a great gadol in the time of in Eretz Yisrael about mitzvahs at place parts with with halachic halacha lemaisa slant of mitzvahs at place parts. Okay, so here we see we're starting to um, change. Okay, now. We go a little further. There was another Rav. His name was Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Halevi. Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Halevi is a, um, a fascinating um, person to discuss. Um, just to mention briefly two things about him, and then we'll get to what his connection with Zram is. Is Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Halevi? We have someone that was to know him very well, which was Rabbi Shrey the Blitzki, also. Uh, um, for in America, less known, but a great gadol living that lived in Bnei Brak, who was Eich Tarich Siyam, that died a few years ago. So, in one of his svarim, he, he so he knew Rabbi Yosef. Um, he knew Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Alevi very well. Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Alevi was the rav in Tel Aviv, a very chash of a rav. And now, first of all, is that he was a very into the gra. Into he was a litvak into the gra. Um, um, he was very into being mekayim mitzvahs yishev haaretz. It was a big thing by him. He learned by Amart of Gimpel Yaffa, a, a Talmud of, 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 of the Valojan world. And one, of, and one of the things that he did, which is most significant for us, and this is what Shari writes out in, this, in the four or five pages that he devotes to him in his Zafer called Oitzer Nechmad, which was printed in 1980, 
So he, he says he wrote 18 Svarim on Halacha, but many of them were specifically about his life project, says Reb Shrey Dabutsky, uh, Mitzvah Satluyas Baritz. Okay. And he held um, that people need to know what to do. So he wrote on Mitzvah Satluyas Baritz. His, one of his first works, which comes out in the 1930s, is 700 pages, a massive work on Trumas and Maestris. It's available. It's called Aser to Aser. It's available on Hebrew books. After 1939, he comes out with a few more books related to Mitzvah Satleis Baritz, each one of big works. Now, just to show you how Chashev is, says um, Shrey Deblitzky. He says that there was a certain Shiloh, a very uh, complicated question. The Chazanish sent, he didn't want to take a Chreis for it, and he recommended who should they go to, to Rabbi Yisrael Tzvi HaLevi. Similarly, um, we find the Stipler also would send people off with difficult questions to this Rabbi Yisrael Tzvi HaLevi. Okay, um, his Anhagas that he had in a shul, which is it's fa- it's more famous today. It's, it's called the Gra Shul in Tel Aviv. Which this this shul was like its own book about um, the Gra aspect of the shul and this type of stuff. But Shrei Deblitzky he recorded <coughs> the Minhagim of this Rabbi Yisrael Tzvi Okay. Anyway, moving on. So we have here after Ramosha Clears, who publishes first in 1925 to 1928, Hilchos Mitzvah Tleis here we have in the early 19, 1935, the start of another, another great Gadol, Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Halevi's projects and Svarim on Mitzvah Tleis Baritz. He continues publishing them through the late 40s. Um, Rabbi Zevin also reviews them and says that they're incredible. Okay. Now these Svarim, what level are they? Are they level for a regular person to be able to open them up, or they're sugyus. I would say they're intense. They're intense, but they're, but the point also is that at least there's a halacha they're the the hilchasa. So a rav at least has somewhere to go to, because to what what I didn't clarify and explain is there's no shulchan aruch really on mitzvah tolis barat. So that makes it hard. You, you, at least you have somewhere to start. You open up your shulchan aruch and then you look. Here you're you're stuck after the Rambam and the few Rishayim that we discussed already. You're on your own. So here now in the 1900s, these various two the two gedolim that we mentioned so far. At least now someone has what to start with. A Rav and it's the Paskin. He has where to uh, uh, some literature to look at. That's that's the significance. Okay, but this is but here we're holding in the 1930s. Okay, so I want to just. Um, um, I want to just mention over here, 1930s. So who all of a sudden comes to, we, we find out that there's a someone very significant who wants to come to Eretz Yisrael. Why? Not, it's beyond the scope of, of today's discussion, but that is the Chazanish. Chazanish is nervous. He's coming to Eretz Yisrael. He's very well aware that there's Mitzvah Satoyis Baritz. What's he going to do? What's And, and um, especially the Chazanish, as we've already explained, is a very halachic, uh, um, um, that's, his, that's his big thing, halacha. So he's concerned what's halacha lamaisa in all different areas of Mitzvah Satoyis Baritz. So he already, before he comes to Eretz Yisrael, he starts writing the letters to um, people that he knew. Uh, he had a very close, um, I believe it's a sort of slash Talmud um, person that he was close with in... Um, in Europe, Moshe Kain Albitsky. Anyway, we have the correspondence. Uh, um, now we have the whole correspondence printed in Gnazim Vetshuves Chazanish Chelik Aleph. So over there, we see that the Chazanish um, he writes back to the Chazanish. The, Ch- the Chazanish writes to him what to do in certain situations. So he writes to him that the situation here in Eretz Yisrael is terrible. Um, he says, um, and, he, and basically he describes. He says, what about the Mai? It was, it's problems. It used to be a little bit before it was okay, but it's it's a problem. And he starts going through all different types of issues related to Zeram in this long letter. And then he says, uh, um, There's other, there's kashrus problems, b'chlal. not only mitzvah satlois barad's issues, okay. Then he says, but I'm, then he, then this, this person writes, I'm, I don't hold that I know, even though this person was a chash of he says, I don't really know enough who should you go to? I recommend you should send your questions and um, to find out from this Rabbi Yosef that we just spoke about. Um, um, as he is the person, he's the right address, Rabbi Yosef Alevi, he's the right address for Inyanam of Eretz Yisrael, and um, he throws in that he was also, he's also, um, he's a son-in-law by Rabbi Naftali Hertz, who Naftali Hertz was very Isaac in the Gra. Um, and also putting out raw materials, he put out the Siddur Okay, then he also throws in in Yerushalayim. There's Rav Cook, 
who's also a Baki Gadol in, in Yanam of Mitzvah Satoy's Barat. Kachava, the Chazanish, goes and writes letters also to um, to Rav Kook, and this is its own parashanut. Uh, uh, people have all different discussions. How, what could you read? Is it, is it a good letter, not good letters? And then the censorship, well, this is all beyond the scope of what we're we're trying to discuss. But the point is that here we have, this is taking place in 1930s, Early 1930s, the matz of Averet Yisrael is bechlal. It's 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 a it's a problem. That's what he's writing back to the Chazanish, and the Chazanish we see is also what what's going to be. Okay. So now um, um, here is where I, this is where I would like to. So what happens? How does Mitzvah Shluis Baruch get saved, so to speak? Where does it become that all of a sudden, on some level at least, there there we now have. Um, a solution that starts to be learned, Zrom starts to be learned, especially with Allah Maisa. What what happens over here? So looking around, what it seems is in in, the, in 1935, around 1935, we have a Yid Rabbi Yitzhak Rosenthal, who is actually closer to the Pesa Frank, he comes up with the idea um, with other people, which we'll get to momentarily, to create a Kailu to learn Zrom the Ian with Allah um go. Okay, now. I just mamish got right now today the documents about this about this um title when they were how when they the first first documents that they were trying to send out. The goal was to to be Mavar Hilchus Hilchus Baras. Okay. So they sent out like we have a lot of times. Um these, this is a how it looked, a fancy Kalkaira. They probably hung it up um all over Tisro. Um and it, and it had the goal, the mission statement, so to speak, which is to learn Zeran, Yerushalmi, which we know we already discussed, to learn all the various Rishonim, Paiskim, whatever there is, and to learn Trumas, Maizus, Arlo, all these things, Halacha, Lamaisa, to learn the Mitzayah, so to speak. Who's behind this whole thing? So it says the, the head of it is Yitzhak Rosenthal. And who's the Gedolim? So it says, Rabbi Avram Yitzhak Akayim Kuk writes a very nice thing about it, that this is a very worthy project. And Ratzi Pesach Frank and a few other Gedolim, the Chaval Yaakov, the author of the Chaval Yaakov, Rab Abba Yaakov Akoyin, and Rab Yosef Gershon Horowitz, and Rab El Yoram. These are the Gedolim in Eretz Yisrael at the time, and they were endorsing it. Okay. Now, then the next thing, it seems they must have gotten some form of funding, and then we have the protocol of what they did and how they learned and their goals and the points, and which was to basically learn properly. Mitzvah Yishev Eretz Yisrael to put out Svarim, publish Svarim, hear Shiurim, and all the different Chaveirim of the the Kailo, Whoever will be in the Kailo will get a stipend. They will hear Shiurim, and and hopefully be productive and produce literature about these years. Who is the heads of the? Who becomes the actual active head besides this Rabbi Yitzhak Rosenthal, who ran it, but he also was involved with the learning. It was Rabbi Pesach Frank or Mrs. Al Meltzer? They give Shiurim to the Chaveir Kailo. Okay. Now, but it goes further than this. This is all taking place in, starting from 1935. Um, they heard Shir Kaseder from um, from Ratzipes of Frank, it seems, and they also would hear Shir very often from Rabbi Zal Meltzer. A few years ago, a volume came out of Rabbi Zal Meltzer's Tyrus on Zrum, taken from his Yerushalmi and Rambam decides. This was based on, it seems, from Shirim and notes of, of people of this Kailu that heard the Shirim back then in the 1930s. Okay, but would anything else happen from this Kailu? And the answer is yes. Um, they put out multiple, multiple, massive, gigantic volumes on all of Hilchus Ram, which were reviewed by Rabbi Zevin, Very and, and it seems each one, some of them were massive chiburim. They weren't just like a five-page article with a shtikal tayra. They were goals with halacha l'maysa. And most significant, just most famous, but even though the list of Kailu members at the time were, we would say, who's who, but just to list the, one of the most prominent people that we knew of, that we know of is Rosh Hashanah Orbach. Rosh Hashanah Orbach, his work. On Shvius and on Trumas was printed under this Machon and this Kail, and the work was done there. So we see this is where, if you want to pinpoint a time that Hilchas Eretz Yisrael seems to be getting much more um, saved, so to speak, is that in this Kail, which wasn't a big Kail, um, Kail's Bechal weren't big in those days, which all these Kail members, they were very hush of a people, they learned, they used to hear Shiran from the Great Kadalim, or Tipeza Frank, or Sazal Meltzer, and they put out massive works so you could see them. I believe they're mostly up on Hebrew books, most of the, the volumes of, the, of this uh, journal. Okay. Now, at the same time, this is, we're going 19, this is 1935, um, so we have, just to mention, the, um, there's a Rav Dinkel's 
earlier, in the previous episode, we spoke about Marash Sirlof. That Marash Sirlof was a ben Deiroi of the Beis Yosef, and he does a massive work on Yushal Mizram. But we said is that the only one volume on Brachas comes out in 1875 by Mar- Rabbi Marcus Lehman. But what about the work on Zram? Interestingly enough, 1935, it starts coming out by a, a, a great literature uh, going with Dinkles, living in Yushalayim at first, eventually moves to Bnei Brak. He was a, from Lutta, seems to have been a Talmud from, from Itzel Panevizher, but also, besides for being a Talmud of his, he ends up having, I think maybe even after the first Karav, but he definitely has a, really, a close relationship with the Chazanish, and he ends up, he starts in 1935, putting out one volume, and he puts out 11 volumes on Shalmi's Ram of Rev the Marash Serlov with a running parish of his. So here we see again another person in the late 19, in the mid 1930s starting. The project took him well into the 50s till he completed it. But in 1934 he puts out Yushalmi uh, Trumas, um, and we see here yet another Gadol putting out a, a massive project in these years in Eretz Yisrael. Now you think what, what I found fascinating about this Rev Dinkles. This is obviously a lot to say about him, but we're not going to, just is that he dies in 1976. So 1958, he finishes his project on Zeran, 11 massive volumes. It's not only a, that he puts out this manuscript, he has a running parish on Yushalmi of his own. He goes ahead now to Tyrus and puts out a massive, a bunch of volumes on Tyrus. I have no idea how he found funding for it or time to do it. He, he put out many, many volumes on Zeran and Tyrus. Okay, anyway, quite obviously, uh, must have been an incredible um, Tamil Chach. Now, Back to us, we're trying to locate works in, in, of Mitzvah of, of Kulis Bar. So we have a Ruchanach Zundel Grossberg, who starts authoring works on ha, more halachadik, more for the Hamoy in the 19, I believe 1939, one of his works come out. Here too, Reb Zevin also reviews a few of them very, with very glowing, um, that they're very useful. He ends up writing on Hilch Shmita, which was more prominent in the game, but also on Trumas and Maestris, Arla, Netteravai, and Klein. Okay, and these come out through the from starting from the 1939 to through the 1960s. He also wrote multiple articles. It was a tremendous time of Okay, but this is all this. What, what's significant for us is this is all happening when in the 1930s. It's starting in the 1930s after this Kailul. Could be it has to do with the Kailul. It could be just them. This is what this is what's happening. Okay, at the same time this is in Petach Tikva. Another Kailul opens up, literally in the 1930s. This Kailul was opened up. By a uh, a, a very hush of a yid who's sort of forgotten a lot in recent years. His name was Rabbi Srel Zisel Dvortz. He was a great Talmud of Ramayshim Arthur Epstein, a Slobotka, involved with Slobotka Yeshiva, and moving Hevron to Eretz Yisrael. He was very involved with all these different things. He wrote a book on on his Rabbi Ramayshim Arthur Epstein, and he was a very big Balmusser, and he ran journals with Musser Dukkah journals, but he also, amongst his many different. So there's a a massive book on him called Kulay Leith, in Slobotka Yerushalayim. It's, um, I would say, how many pages? It's over 500 pages. So he opens up a kail in Petach Tikva, where the goal of this kail is, again, because there's a necessity to, we don't know, Mitzvah Toys Baritz is not being learned. And the kail opens up, has a journal also, where they put in tyrus of different um, um, members of their kail. And besides for putting out stuff of their kail, um, they get other materials related to Eretz Yisrael, and they're also into this, and he... And he this was his, um, he founded this. Now, interesting thing is that he had a son-in-law. His son-in-law was, in the yeshiva world, Rab Aryeh Pamaranchik. Rab Aryeh Pamaranchik, in many places, he's, he, um, people don't call him by his name, they call him the Emek Bracha, or in some world, the Tyrus Ram, one of the great, great Talmidim of the Briska Rav. The yeshiva Shevelt, Arayim, his, his Tyrus is considered unbelievable. He was able to have a very, very close relationship with the Briska Rav. I think he learned with him over 10 years. Um, and his Taira is loved by many Adayan. What's less known about him is the following. He dies at the age of 34. Tragic. And he puts out Taira's Ram. And this is after, uh, Taira's Ram is two parts. He wasn't able to afford it. But um, but he's the son-in-law of this Rabbi Yisrael Dvortz that we just mentioned. Not only is he a brisker, full-fledged brisker. You can't get better than this. He's learned with the brisker of 10 years. He's a Talmud of Mishra also. Um, Agav, there's a beautiful article from a friend of mine, Rabbi, Rabbi Elio Reich of Lakewood, in the Yishu, one of the Yishurans, an excellent article, available by uh, via PDF, if you email me, where he collects all the information about this young guy, which I did not realize he was Nifter at 34, because he's, he's crazy famous, Ara um, um, 
from even just doing so from doing so uh, for, from printing so few works and he's very famous but what's significant for us is he's writing on Zram. Tyre Zram is two volumes of his on Zram. Uh, interesting review can be found by Rebzevin also. Okay. So we see that now, this is also, again, taking place in the late 1930s and early 1940s. So we see Zram is finally getting on the map a little bit. Between Yerushalayim, Petach Tikva, some Svarim. Okay. Also, again, in the 1940s, a manuscript comes out, which I would say also was a shock to the, to the Tyre world. And this is... The Aruch HaShulchan HaAsim comes out in 1938. 1930. Now, we, everyone knew about the Aruch HaShulchan, and it was incredible as Aruch HaShulchan wrote, not only on Aruch Haim, but he wrote on Dal Chalke Shulchan Aruch. What was not known is that the Aruch HaShulchan had a work on Zrayim, Kachim, and Tyrus, the same style. All of a sudden, 1938, which, I, which the way I'm describing Zrayim is, is a disaster, they start putting out a volume of his on Zrayim and not a, another volume of his on Zrayim. Reb Zevin writes in his book review on the Sefer HaShulchan Asad that everyone was just blown away. It was incredible. It's different. First of all, no, no one could believe. Not only was he able to do Dal Chelke HaShulchan Aruch, he did something which was unheard of. He wrote on Gant, on Kala Tarakula, and no one knew about it. Now, here there's a little difference because he has less sources than Dal Chelke HaShulchan Aruch and Kala Tarakula. So here, in these areas, he's much more relying on Yushalmi and Tesefta, obviously. Rav Zevin points out one little ha'ara that he does, if he doesn't understand why, he doesn't use the Paso Shulcha when he should have mentioned it a little. Okay, but but be that as it may, Rav Zevin's review is a, um, um, is a ex, that it's excellent. The Arach Shulchan doesn't really need um, Rav Zevin even to who was very into the Arach Shulchan, but um, but Rav Zevin is very pro this. And what's significant is again, when is this happening? In the early in 1938 and on. Now. If you think about it, what's happening is what's going on in Europe at the same time. The world is coming to the sad, the entire world is, be, is about to be destroyed. And Zrum, which wasn't on the map even, all of a sudden now, starting from 1935 till the 1940, late 1940s and even onwards, we see a new area of Tyra is the A is being, which was uncharted territories, the few what I documented up till now, is now finally getting on the map on some level. Mamish, at the same time, there's a destruction in Klal Yisrael on unparalleled levels that never, ever happened before. Obviously, there's something going on, but not for me to try to even begin to fathom. Just when you think about the years, it's incredible. Okay. Wow. Amazing. Um, before you continue, you've been mentioning, you've mentioned in many episodes, and you've mentioned now a lot there of Zevin's book reviews. Maybe just tell the audience what you're referring to, what the name of the Sefer is, and where they can find this content. Okay, so it's correct. I'm very, I, someone that I'm very, I was very influenced for many years is Rav Shlomi Yasef Zevin. Rav Shlomi Yasef Zevin um, is famous for writing a sefer called Mayan and Balacha and also for being the head uh, head editor of my of Encyclopedia Talmudis. The first 17, 18 volumes, I believe it is, he was mamish involved with every aspect of it and he was involved with this, in how it was created. There was obviously changes after he died. Not for now, but anyway, he wrote many other svarim. Besides writing svarim, um, such as Me'an Malacha, which is one of the most popular svarim that were printed in the past hundred years, is he used to write book reviews about svarim in the various newspapers. And these svar, these book reviews are unbelievable because they penetrate sometimes into the Sefer. He's able to find the strengths of the Sefer and the weaknesses of the Sefer. He usually tries to be positive. He'll try to be spin a positive uh, thing, but he he was such a tremendous tamachacham. He was able to pick up a sefer, and immediately because he knew kol terukula on his fingertips in unparalleled uh, levels, it, literally kol terukula, um, kol terukula meaning to say shisha shidri mishnah zram tyrus. You could see from the reviews of his on this farm, achrishayim achrayim. You name it in in the various reviews. So some of the some of these reviews was collected into a three volume set called Sai from the Svarim. For some reason they were not reprinted. People always ask me. I, I do sell them once from one, from time to time when I find a copy or two of them. Excellent, excellent reviews because you get to learn a, a lot. You get to learn about the specific safer. Um, and some of them are famous people. Interesting. Um, like today I was reading one about the stipler. But he doesn't say it's the stipler, and the stipler at that time didn't write on this safer that it's his. And he says he's not going to be Megala Soy, that it's the stipler, but today we know it's the stipler. But it's a very interesting review. In general, all the re- it's a fascinating read. I highly recommend if one can find them to get them, even if you don't know the particular farm. But some a lot of the farm people do know. Um, so those farm, it's, it's even more gishmak. But in general, everything he says is, is, is unbelievable. 
Um, again, that's my opinion. Obviously, some people will, will are, are completely entitled to argue, um, but that's what I refer to many times. So in, in these episodes, Marshall for Zra, in, in two of his volumes of Siphon Visvarim, they have a nice amount of reviews about the various Svarim on Zra. And he was living in Eretz Yisrael, so he knew um, firsthand, he knew very well the Sugis and Zra, as you can see from the, just looking at the reviews, what he was holding in, the Chuvas, the Rishayin, the, the Sugis, unbelievable. He also, one of the significant things is, he had an unbelievable Kayach Siva. That he knew how to write. He had unbelievable writing skills that basically trained the next generation of how to write of writers. Um, and that's why he was the head of Mechon Tam Yisraeli, in fact, with Peter Mudis and other projects. So this is a very short, very brief Barab Zevin. You put me on the spot over here. I feel terrible because it's not doing justice to the great Rishlam Yesu Zevin, um, who I would, would obviously spend a lot, a lot of time to talk about him, but maybe it's better that you put me on the spot about him. Anyway, um, so that's what Zevin these book reviews, and that's what he says about the Shulchan Asit and this discovery. What I'm trying to emphasize is this is all taking place in the 40s. Now, okay, now we're coming closer to, even though the Dar Hamuna is 1984, we're getting a much, much closer to us. Um, and how is that? We didn't mention the Yid, the great Yid, who we just mentioned a few minutes ago that he's coming to Eretz Yisrael, the Chazanish. What about the Chazanish and Eretz Yisrael? This is the interesting. So he said he comes 1933. He comes to Eretz Yisrael. So right away, he puts his full kaiches into learning. As we said, Chazan Shalach Lamaisa was the most important thing by him to learning Zrum. And he, and right away, starts coming out materials of his on Zrum. Well, Kalman Kahana in his incredible book on the Chazanish called the Ish the Chazanoi, he knew the he was able to know the Chazanish very well. So he says this the first he puts out all about Shemitah, because obviously Shemitah was a very hot topic. This is the first work that the Khaznish puts out in 1937-1938 in Eretz Yisrael, but then already he starts putting out about the Mai um Maestris, dealing with the Mishnayas, Talmud Yushalmi. This comes out in 1938. And he's and, and the rest of the, and the next few swarm of his are the third safer of his is Klayim and Arla. Anyone who learned to climb recently in Mishnah Yomi will know that climb is murder. Forget about to learn it. But Yun, one looks at the Chazanish and you're just like, holy, how in the world did this person do this? But yes, this is the Chazanish we're talking about. So this Sefer of his comes out, intense, intense Be'yun, uh, with Halacha Lema'isa, Maskanus of Hilchus Eretz Yisrael. Basically, the Chazanish comes on the scene and he puts out his Chiburim on Zram one after the other, as a common kind of documents. Okay. Now, but they're very intense, as we said. They're, they're, you mamish have to be holding it to the sugya, as you asked earlier. Is this for a, a regular guy who wants to know the halacha? The answer is, um, it's not easy. Okay, we're coming to the end. Is a small sefer comes out from the famous Rechil Michal Tukashinsky called Sefer Eretz Yisrael. In here, he has a little bit, uh, a section, uh, halacha l'maiser for the masses more, I would say. Hilchas Eretz Yisrael also, of Trumas Amaiser, Mitzvah Satulis Ba'aretz. This comes out after he dies. In um, nineteen in nineteen fifty five called Sefer Eretz Yisrael, and this is I would say one of the first svarim that deal with halacha l'maisa, and one other sefer which is also very important is from Rokam Kahana, who we mentioned was very close to the Chazanish. He starts putting out um, he puts out uh, also for the masses. It's found in numerous numerous editions of the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch in the back. Mitzvah Satoyis Baritz Alpi the Pesachim of the Chazanish, but for the masses who did this Rokam Kahana. Okay. Um, to be Messiah, with one last uh, one last Akuda over here, is that Rav Shrey the Blitzky, who I earlier mentioned, who was also tremendously in Talacha, so it seems that in, in these years, in the 1950s, he also was working on a Mishnah Bura type Sefer, on, which was going to be all of Hilchah's run. Um, the first volume was supposed to be about Arla, it was called Shuris Hadin. We have one page of it, from the Shar of the and the Shar of the page we also have, and from this we see that it was supposed to be something which a Mishnah Bura collecting all the materials, I'll be the style of, of the Mishnah Bura, Mamish, it says this in, in, in the Shar of the Sefer, and the one page that we have is Mamish, a Mishnah Bura, Bir Halacha, Shar Tzin type stuff. But Lamaisa, we don't know why, it never happened, it never came out, it doesn't. It seems not to even exist in manuscript. Okay, so this is, Ad Khan, we have summed up, um, in brief, the Matziv of Halacha Lamaisa getting us through the 50s in Eretz Yisrael that finally 
um, because of the various different gedolim and the kailos that start to learn it, it starts becoming what we would call a mitzayah that is starting. To, that it's even in the it's even in the and the shulchan of, of rabbanim to start talking about to start handling etc. This is this is the background that with this we can now begin to start talking about what Rebbe Kanievsky started doing. This is the fifties is when he's. Um, a young person starting to learn, and we'll continue in Mir Tzushem in the next episode explaining what he does with Zran and Mir Tzushem. Okay, fascinating as always. Thank you so much for sharing. Again, please send in your comments and suggestions, your criticism to myself, Shwed M S C H W E D M at OU.org, or to Eliezer Brutt at Gmail. Dot com. Okay, looking forward to getting to the actual Derech Amuna the next time we speak. Have a wonderful day.